Sabrina Bench, and welcome to the My Digital Farmer podcast. In today's market, it's not enough to just grow your product. You've got to know how to sell it, too. Welcome to the My Digital Farmer podcast, where we reveal online marketing strategies and tips to help farmers like you get better and more confident at marketing. Learn how to find more customers, increase your sales, and build a strong brand for your farm. Let's start the show. Well, welcome to episode 109 of the My Digital Farmer podcast. I am your host, Corinna Bench from Shared Legacy Farm CSA out in Elmore, Ohio. I'm also the founder of MyDigitalFarmer.com and this podcast, which is all about trying to help other farmers get more confident in their marketing and in their messaging. How's everyone doing today? I hope you're having an awesome week. I am sitting in my new living room. So we updated our old farmhouse living room this winter. It has been a multiple month project. I've been living in a sea of chaos where there's just filing cabinets where there shouldn't be filing cabinets and all kinds of junk just slammed into the middle of a living room so that we can be painting. And you know how like painting ends up taking two months? Well, that's kind of what happened for us. (laughs) But finally, it's done. We had our carpet installers come in today and finish all of the carpet. And as they were leaving, I pulled them aside. I was like, listen, this is going to sound really lame and cheesy, but I just want you to know that you are not just in the business of installing carpet. You guys are building me a beautiful home. And I actually like teared up in front of them. And I think the guy got a little misty eyed too. So I feel like I gave purpose today to some uh, people who are installing carpet. Anyway, I am now doing my podcast recording from a different corner of the room and a much more brightly lit area feeling awesome. So hope you guys are having a wonderful week. Uh, Today, we are going to be interviewing a farmer by the name of Ann Stone from Elmwood Stock Farm out in Kentucky. And I did a website audit for Ann a few months ago, and I enjoyed the process of working with her so much. I was so impressed with the work they had done on their website that I wanted her to come on to the show and talk to you guys. They have a pretty awesome operation which I could see by studying their website. And so I said, Anne, would you mind coming onto the podcast and talking all things marketing and sales with me? Because clearly you guys have your act together. So Elmwood Stock Farm is a sixth generation family farm on about 550 acres outside of Georgetown, Kentucky. And they're a USDA certified organic operation. They produce vegetables, fruits, pantry items, pasture raised poultry and pork, grass fed, grass finished beef and lamb. And, um, heritage turkeys as well. She and Mac, her husband, manage the CSA farm share and all the product marketing and the poultry and the sheep flocks. So I'm not going to just dive into her mind and we're going to pick apart how she goes about running this awesome operation. I really can't wait to share it with you. It's a really fascinating interview. Tons and tons of good ideas in here. So I want you to listen. You might even listen to it twice. Take notes and um, maybe take some of her ideas and put them into your own CSA. You can find the show notes for today at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash 109. And you're definitely going to want to go there because I'm going to link to several awesome resources in today's episode. All right. So without further ado, let me introduce you to my guest, Anne Stone. Anne, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Corinna. I'm really excited to be here. And I want you to get everyone started here and introduce yourself, your farm, what you guys are all about, um, the rise of Elmwood Stock Farm, how you came to be. Sure. Um, So Elmwood Stock Farm is situated in the um, central part of Kentucky in the Bluegrass region. Uh, We've been a farm and a farm family for multiple generations. So traditional to our area, we started in Burley Tobacco and beef cattle, like a lot of farms here. And then when my brother and I came along and said, Dad, I think we want to farm with you, he said, great, so figure out what you're going to do. And we actually moved into vegetables predominantly then. So over the years, um, we've transitioned the farm to vegetables and pastured meats. Um, We also transitioned from conventional type of farming to 
certified organic. Um, mm -hmm. We started off thinking, well, we'll do some sales to the local grocery stores. At one point, we were even in Kroger's and Walmarts and those kind of things. And we were also selling at farmer's markets. And we thought, well, we'll see which one of these works out for us. Um, so for a number of years, we did both. And then fast forward to the last several years, we've been mostly a CSA, vegetable farm, and farmer's markets. And then we have uh, a variety of organic and pasture-raised uh, meats. We have a beef cattle herd. We've added pastured pork. We have lamb, uh, heritage breed turkeys, pasture-raised chickens, and then laying hens for eggs. So at this time in 2021, everything that we sell is direct to our customer. We still have a handful of restaurants and you know, our local uh, food co-op store that we still offer some wholesale pricing of a few different products, but uh, predominantly everything is direct to the person that takes it home and eats it. And what was the reason for you shifting in that direction? So a couple things happened. Um, my brother and I both uh, wanted to start our own families and be involved in farming. And we needed to figure out a way with the same acreage and the same footprint um, to produce for three families rather than just one. Um, we're in an area that's kind of adjacent to some subdivisions and you know that the city's kind of moving out into the countryside and we're one of the actual buffer farms for that. Um, additionally, we began to learn more about organic production. Um, and we had learned actually about CSA many years before we started, but we just felt like the whole concept of somebody prepaying you in advance for something you hadn't grown yet, which was so foreign, as you know, to all types of farming. I mean, just that whole, that whole thing. I mean, I'm still amazed when somebody gives us a check for a thousand dollars for the season. I'm just grateful for that and appreciative of that partnership. But, um, as we learned about that and, and switched from tobacco to food crops, we felt like organic was an important part of it. Um, so a lot of transitioning was happening. And of course, we didn't want to stay a tobacco farm. Um, it was a good during its time and it certainly you know, helped my parents pay for us both to go to college, but um, it wasn't something that we were going to be able to continue. So a lot of farmers in Kentucky were looking for what's the magic crop, what's the magic thing that's going to let all the farmers transition for tobacco. And the answer was everyone had to find their own way. Um, and so for us, it was in the food crops. Hmm. So clarify for me, who are the different family members that are helping run the operation mm -hmm. yep. now? So my husband and myself, um, my husband's worked off farm until recently for many years, although within agriculture, we actually met at a farming conference. Um, he and I um, kind of handle the farmer's markets and the CSA, the marketing side of it, as well as he raises the poultry and the sheep. My brother, John Bell, um, raises all the vegetables and manages the beef cattle herd and recently has taken on the pastured uh, pigs as well. And then my parents, um, Kay and Cecil Bell, are still here on the farm. Um, our dad helps out with making hay in the summer so that we have hay for the cattle herd all winter um, and some of the bigger projects, but it has stepped back quite a bit in, you know, in recent years because he's been farming for a long, long, long time. So this business is actually sustaining three different families at this time? Currently it is. And then we couldn't do any of it at this point without our, our team and our staff. Um, yeah. You know, we've been doing vegetables for over 25 years now, so <laughs> hmm. that sounds like a really long time when I say it that way. Um, but, you know, when we first started, it, it was us and whoever would help us for seasonality, you know, during particular times of the year. Um, we've got to the point now where we have um, part-time workers, we have probably about six people that are year round, some are part-time, some are full-time. And then we have a, um, a big hiring in this time of year. So we have um, people that come and are just here for the summer season. So I'm curious, when, when you go to your website, you're, you're kind of 
given three different options, as I recall, for how one could do business with you. And you have a the CSA, you have um, online market sales, I guess is what I would call it. And then there was also like a deliveries, like where you would actually ship things. Mm -hmm. um, are each of those equally uh, a big part of your business? Or would you say that one is the big money maker for you? Like what's the reasoning behind those three tracks? Mm -hmm. So um, probably up until about the beginning of 2020, um, you know, CSA was about half of our business and we still had a lot of other vegetables that um, we were attending up to five farmers markets a week and then local delivery, whether it was individual or um, restaurants. Um, we, a couple days a week, um, have somebody on the road in our van making deliveries of produce and meats. Um, when we started raising the Heritage Breed turkeys, we quickly outgrew the local market because it's such a specialty niche product. Um, it's one of the favorite things that we raise. Um, we're one of the few farms in the country that has heritage and organic. And so we started getting a lot of interest on shipping. And so we've shipped turkeys for at least 10 years now. Um, we started off on another website, localharvests.org was where we were for a while. Um, and then eventually built our own website for the shipping portion. Um, we've added on different meats and other things to ship over the last couple of years, really. And so at this day and time, CSA is a lot more than half of our sales, and we've reduced our presence at farmer's market, and that's just more related to the last year and how everything changed. Hmm. So your customers really aren't just local anymore. You've got a regional audience or even maybe a national audience of people that are buying. So that is our area of growth. Um, we kind of are at a good spot with the production of the vegetables, the amount of vegetables that we have that our acreage can sustain, that our staff that are experienced at what they're doing, um, kind of the footprint that we want to be right there. Um, we do have some growth potential in our meats. Um, and I think both locally by having some of our vegetable people learn more about, oh, you do actually also grow meat and or, you know, have organic chicken or you have eggs or you have grass fed beef. Um, but then also some of those turkey customers are beginning to ask, what other things do you have? Um, so we've been slowly but surely kind of building up a base that way. Um, it's it's a little bit of just how we've evolved, not necessarily that we sat down and said that's going to be our plan. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting because we found that to be true for our farm as well. It was sort of an accidental discovery that mm -hmm. the the way that we were beginning to maximize our profits was actually on our own customer base as we began to create more products for them they kept asking what else what else do you have <laughs> and we yes, realized yes. oh i guess we should make more things available for you <laughs> and uh, that became the the challenge right trying to figure out how can we package this how can we what can what else yes. can we even grow or um, partnerships can we create to help sell more items so that's really interesting yeah. so where do people enter your farm like i feel like most businesses kind of have a point of entry where most people discover them and then they start to branch out do you feel like you have a point of entry for your business too so i think um for many years it was probably at farmers market it was a lot of face-to-face -face conversation education um you know I, we've had so many questions about what does organic mean or what is grass-fed or why is your meat different than what i can find in the supermarket um, and we continue that, but it, there's not as much of that interaction now. At some point, um, you, you just there's not enough of you to have that many conversations. Um, so our website has begun to serve that purpose, hopefully. So we've always tried to have an um, informational website. Um, and I think, you know, now the e-commerce portion of it needs to... Um, be improved to, to, be, to provide just as much information. Um, we were kind of an early adopter of the website. Um, we were probably late to the party on having a Facebook page. <laughs> and um, that being said, uh, and we can talk more about the website specifically in a little bit. The other way that people kind of entered to us is the word of mouth. Um, so CSA, there was another farm in our area, but we were one of the second or third farms really um, next to a, a, a bigger city here 
that was introducing what CSA was. And so our first season of CSA were only 45 members. Um, although we were still growing quite a bit of, of product, we were just kind of trying to find new customers that the farmer's market didn't work for. And this was an, a new way. And we just have grown that incrementally over the years. This will be the 18th season of CSA. Um, so we kind of, you know, we got to 300 and we sat there for a little bit and then jumped up again. And we were at 650 for several years. And then actually last year we increased to 850, um, which is the most we've ever been and, and seems like a good fit for us. Um, so how how are you leveraging the word of mouth? Is it something that you're intentionally mm -hmm. encouraging your people to do at some point in the year or or, or do you just does it just happen naturally because they love it so much and they tell their friends? <laughs> well, it's happened naturally mostly. I think it's mm -hmm. part of our conversation on some marketing plans for this year is to be a little more intentional. And it's not always so positive. You know, we're we're definitely want people to know what they're doing when they sign up. So we encourage them to talk to someone else because they can tell them the good and the challenges as well um, mm -hmm. and get the real picture behind the scenes. And then, you know, that kind of happens within the workplace or with friends and family. Um, an additional thing that happened within CSA in our area is there's an organization called the Kentucky Farm Share Coalition, and we yeah. are part of that with the other farms. And that group um, helps to get workplace situations for CSA pickup for employees. And then the other aspect of that is there's been some research done um, through the University of Kentucky that shows if a employee is a member of an organic CSA, that they actually spend less time in the doctor's office and the insurance agency for that employer will spend less dollars on insurance related expenses. So the employers are giving cost share vouchers to the employees to join an organic CSA. So mm -hmm. a lot of years and a lot of effort and we were one of the pilot projects on that and have stayed with it. And it's been really good to open up CSA to people who never else would have thought about it. That being said, every year we have a lot of first time CSA members who yeah. might not necessarily be a great candidate for a CSA program, but they have to go through it for a year to know that. Yeah. Um, so we're kind of balancing members who've been with us for you know more than a decade with members who just learned about CSA a week ago, now they're signed up and their first share is coming tomorrow, what do they do? Um, right. So. That is an interesting conundrum with WorkShare CSAs, I think, that sometimes people are incentivized to give it a go, but they may not always be, to your point, the right fit, and it might take them a year to discover that. Um, so what have you learned about what is the right fit? I mean, do you yeah. see some patterns with, and, and you have different products too. So I guess I'd be curious too, if you see a difference between the kind of person that mm -hmm. would love vegetables and be successful versus someone who's going to be great with some of your meats. Mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts there about what you see? What are the patterns you see in your customers? Well, and I think it, what we used to see is a little bit different now. It has changed. So for many years, we had the traditional CSA where we chose the products. It was based on what we planted and what was ready for harvest, essentially, while still trying to put together, you know, a nice box that covered all the different um, types of vegetables each week. Um, and we did the swap and that kind of thing where there was a little bit of customization, but really essentially not very much at all. Um, there was definitely a particular customer who wanted to eat local, who wanted to partner with a farm, who was willing to be surprised every week, who was willing to put the effort in for cooking unusual things, doing the research. And sometimes, you know, we found they might have been seeking us out for convenience or for organic and didn't re realize that they were not good candidates for the other parts of it until they were in the midst of it. Um, as we uh, made the decision to move to a customizable CSA share, 
it does open the door for people who might not have done a traditional CSA to be willing to do a CSA because they can always be sure that they're not going to have beets in their share because they always have the opportunity to remove them. Um, that being said, the way our program is set up, we choose to have vegetables swap for vegetables because we have a, you know, a certain amount of produce that's planted and we want to encourage them to eat produce. So they, they can choose potatoes every single time and take everything else out, but they're not going to be able to choose eggs or meat instead of potatoes. Um, separately, we do offer meat um, CSA, like a surprise share where we decide every week what they get or a choose my own option where it's essentially a prepay with a buy down and they sign up for, and we agree to set aside a certain quantity of all the best cuts of meat so it's available for our CSA members. Mm -hmm. And then of course we have the egg share as well where they can do a half dozen or a dozen every week. Um, so I'm, I think I answered your question. But yeah, I kind of went off yes. track there. <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. Uh, so, if a if a person, do you find that that people will purchase the vegetable CSA and then start dabbling in your meat CSA, or vice versa? I mean, is that starting to happen more and more? Definitely does. So sometimes we have people that only want the meat portion because they grow their own garden, but what happens is each week when they log in to our site into their account to choose their meats, they see all the vegetables. And so then they'll add some vegetables and then maybe the next summer they're signing up for a smaller vegetable share as well um, because they, they do get exposure to that. And that's one of the things that we like about the customization program we have is that we pre-populate it with a share. So if they forget to log in or don't want to, they're still gonna get the farm choice traditional share. But if they do log in, then they can swap everything out and start over. They can add extras and pay for those extra items. They could add just extra meat or just extra eggs if they don't have a meat share and pay for that as well. And mm. it, it's a lot of flex flexibility for them. Yeah, and actually when you have the customizable model, one of the, I think the good parts about it is that it, it trains the customer to, to develop a new habit, which is to go and set up my order every week right and and that to your point is uh where they begin to increase the average order value uh and so the more you can get customers to begin to fall into that habit uh, that's going to increase your revenues for sure so and it's all about how you set up that experience that buying experience right um, you need to make sure you have extra inventory in there to do that I was just going to say in that portion, it's essentially an additional shopping cart that we have within our CSA program. So if there's items like ribeye steak or boneless, skinless chicken breast that we don't have enough to offer at market or on our on, online store for the general public, it can only be offered to the CSA members. And I mean, that's the commitment we make to them because they're committing to us we commit to them and you know only when we have excess or they've been offered it week after week after week and aren't buying then we can put that out to the public so yeah that's also a wonderful benefit it's kind of like it's a perk of membership that they yeah. know they're going to be getting first dibs and I hope you advertise it that way when you talk about your membership because that's sort of a yeah. makes someone think oh this is a reason why I should be a member so yeah. tell me a little bit about your your online store mm -hmm. Um, because you're not using uh, Harvey or Farmigo. Yeah, so our website itself is actually a WordPress website. Um, it's what we had for many, many years. And a year ago, we looked to update our website because it was in desperate need of some attention. We actually, that's when I first met you, um, reached out mm -hmm. to you for some assistance there. And um, we were ready to jump to, I think, Squarespace and got some advice that we had so many um, link backs, so many, um, we were already ranking so high in SEO that we were gonna hurt ourselves if we switched to a different host. I think I'm using the right yeah. language. Um, anyway, yeah. so we ended up upgrading with WordPress. And as a portion of that, we're using WooCommerce, which is a plugin for WordPress for our online store. Um, separately, 
Happy CSA is the name of the software that does the software program. And the really nice benefit of it is if someone has a $30 CSA share and they don't want their share next week because they're traveling, they can hit cancel and that $30 will carry over to the next week. So then two weeks from now when they log in, they have $30 in credit sitting there and say that they only want $10 worth of vegetables. Well, then the rest of that will carry over to the third week. And so it, you have the ability to ebb and flow with how much you use each week. You don't have to use everything the second week. You can spread it out just a little bit at a time over all the weeks of the season. Um, and there have been some improvements from year to year um, within the program. Like now we're able to do the meets as well. When we first looked for customizing, there were you know a handful of options and we seriously considered it different things and um, this kind of fit our needs at the time because we have spent a lot of time and energy and we actually have a full-time person on staff that works with me in the office on customer service and we felt like we didn't want to give up that um, aspect of interaction with our customers um, which I think some of the other programs provide the customer service and that's a nice benefit, but we weren't going to, um, we were going to be paying double for that same portion in our heads because we wanted to have somebody here with us and staff. So on that aspect, um, we've stayed with the happy CSA. Um, this is our, we're entering into the fifth summer. So we've done four and a half seasons with it. And we do three seasons a year, a winter, which we just finished this week. Um, a summer program runs 21 weeks, and then we do a fall season that's over a 10-week period in October through December. Now, is the Happy CSA program a, uh, a weekly subscription as well, or is it something that accommodates, hey, I want you to prepay up front and we're buying it down? I know it obviously does that because that's what you do, but is there also a way to set it up as a weekly subscription where you're, you're getting billed weekly? Um, so for the individual member, you can be a year round member where uh, you would pay on a weekly or monthly basis. The way okay. we have it set up is in the three seasons and we ask members to prepay because okay. we don't do a lot on collection. <laughs> um, yeah. One other aspect that's a little different of the happy is that as a customer, you can actually add something to your share and not pay for it. Um, and then pay later. So there's still a, a good number of people that want to pay either in cash or with a check rather mm -hmm. than a debit or a credit card. And so this allows them to go in, log in to their account, customize their share and stick in the check in the mail today. And the, their share will still be delivered tomorrow because we've made that agreement that we are going to let them do that. Are you the person that told me about Happy Share CSA on another post or was that okay? Yeah. I feel I'm like, I've heard of this and I need <laughs> now I'm like now I need to reach out to them. <laughs> yeah. This sounds really cool. This sounds really awesome. What's the what's the investment for you for that software? So that was something that was probably most attractive to us in the beginning is that you pay per member. So if you have a 600 member CSA, then you pay that five to 600 member is this rate for the year or this rate mm -hmm. per month rather than a percent of sales. Um, so we were with um, Small Farm Central for many years and kind of used that program. And I was, we were used to doing the per member fee as opposed to the percent of sales. Um, so that's, that's been nice because you can budget and know what your expense is going to be. Yeah, for sure. And are you, do you have the ability to turn off credit card payments for everything if you want so that it's always check payment? I believe you can set it up that way. Yes. We so, have it set okay. up where it, right. it runs through our PayPal account. Sure. So when they, they actually make the payment and then they also cover the credit card fee, the member yeah. does, which is nice. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, awesome. I'm sure you have a lot of people listening who are thinking, oh, I've never heard of that one. And, uh, and they're all going to go check that out. So thanks for sure. sharing a little bit of insight on that. That's yeah. pretty cool. I hope they do. It's, it's worked well for us. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I want to talk a little bit about just your marketing strategies, because you've got multiple 
products in your product suite, you have the CSA and you've got this um, online store thing where you're probably reaching retail customers who aren't in your CSA. And then you've got people that, you know, are living out in the big, big wide internet world, <laughs> maybe living in another state who are found out about you and you want to try and sell to them. So what, what has been, I guess, what are the predominant marketing strategies that you are using? Maybe there's one or two that are really at the top that are helping you find new customers or continue to, yeah, let's talk about just finding new customers. Sure. Um, so we kind of talked about that a little at the beginning. Um, part of uh, attending farmer's markets was to sell product, obviously, but it also was a first point of contact for a lot of members. And so seeing our product, talking to us or our staff, um, recognizing the consistency, the quality, you know, we keep showing up, um, educational component that we've always had as part of what we do. I mean, if we don't have it here, then we will help them find someone that does. Um, we've done farm tours to educate about organic production and why you should choose to eat good food for yourself. All of that um, helps maybe establish some type of relationship. And so that combined with just having the web presence for people to educate themselves at their on their own time about CSA or about the difference in grass fed and grain fed meats or whatever the po component is. So for many years, it was that, um, you know, long ago before the internet got the way it is today. I mean, it was just a lot of um, speaking to events. Um, mm -hmm. My husband has probably spoken to every garden club and book club and Sierra club and whoever would have somebody to talk about um, why you should eat good local food. Um, that and we did mailers and flyers and we partnered with uh, gyms and yoga studios and health food stores and just all of the, just the legwork that you know that goes into it. Um, I think these days, you know, we're still working on marketing. And so we have accumulated, you know, emails over the years, not just our CSA members, but that's an email list was uh, something that we started early on. And fortunately, you know, we had no idea where that was going to go. Um, we've moved to, it's either a bi-weekly or a weekly email. So currently we do an e mm -hmm. weekly e email every week that has news from the farm. Um, it talks about uh, there's usually several components that are always present and sometimes we have conversation about you know we're in hiring right now so the email that went out last night we had to take out some things so that we could better focus on making sure that that was front and center um, the shipping when that got up you know when we had a new website when we had our new brand all the things were nice to be able to feature we usually try to have a recipe that relates to some of our products and then we connect to link to that product in the web store. Um, we actually did a little video this past week and so we did a video of making the recipe and so we have so many eggs that we have a, a special on eggs so that links to that and trying to encourage. So we're trying to do more of a focused effort on tying it all together and being consistent. Um, I personally have been handling posting on social. And so some of our team is starting to take on different parts of that. But um, our goal this year is just to increase the presence there. Um, the other portion that we're really working on, and this kind of ties back to when you were asking about the CSA members, is to take your advice actually and focus more on letting a first time CSA member develop into a better member. And so mm -hmm. focusing on CSA member retention by providing them all the tools that they need to mm -hmm. succeed. Um, so we're starting a, a CSA a Facebook group this year and we're excited on that. So we have some plans to um, have some of our older, more experienced members engaged and to be able to bring along some of our newer members who this whole CSA experience is going to be really new for them. 
Um, and you have, you said you have 850 people potentially who could be in that, in that group. They won't all join, but that's a, that'll be a nice size group. That's really going to, uh, yeah, we're, we're excited, and nervous. People... <laughs> <laughs> excited and nervous at the same time. Um, but we're, we're hoping to have some good engagement. Um, but it also means that we just need to be on Facebook a little more than we have been as well. Um, yeah. So I've yeah. got a couple um, people that work here at the farm that are excited about it, um, that are going to help as well. So between, you know, the three of us, um, we feel like we have a good plan going forward. So we'll have to, we'll have to check back and let you know how that goes. <laughs> I'm excited for you because I, I have just found that Facebook groups end up becoming a content creation engine for you too, because if you decide, for example, that you're going to be the creator of content in there, like, oh, I'm going to do a quick video on this for the group, then you can download that video um, and then link it up in your email, right? Like you can multitask it or repurpose it later, three months later, if it was a really good video about pesto, you can point to it yet again, or you'll find that your own members will start creating really neat ideas. You know, they'll post a picture with a recipe yeah. and be like, I made this and you can get permission, take that picture and put it in your newsletter and say, so-and-so put this in the group last week. Right. So it, it kind of gives you a lot of inspiration for how you can then take that information and put it out into your other marketing channels and say, here's what people are doing with our food and highlighting their own successes. So I think it's going to be Fantastic. I have no doubt that you're going to crush it, especially with that many people. <laughs> well, Very exciting. Thank so you. do you have any training in marketing um, or are you self-taught like me? <laughs> yeah, the short answer is no, probably um, self-taught. I mean, I've been to many conferences, many years of, of traveling, you know, spending time and money trying to learn. Um, nowadays, you know, with podcasts, it's awesome because it provides so much information to us here at the farm. We don't have to leave anymore. Um, you know, I've listened to almost all of your podcasts, if not all of them, but you know, I'm a regular listener, uh, of, and I think you do an awesome job. And, um, yeah, there's, you know, saved in my phone, saved in the laptop. There's a, a whole list of, of things that we want to listen to next. And, and I, I want everyone who's listening to be encouraged by that because I think a lot of farmers think that they have to go out and like get all this training to feel confident. And I think you and I are here to tell them like, no, you can just, you can learn it from other people and just try a bunch of things and see what works, <laughs> and yes. make mistakes along the way. I'm sure that you've tried some things and they haven't always worked and you've sort of had to pivot. And that's, yeah. that's just part, that's part of the journey. Uh, where are you spending most of your time on marketing? Because one of the questions I get from people a lot is like, if I only have an hour a week, what should I be doing with it? Uh, mm -hmm. So where do you, where do you find that uh, your marketing is moving the needle the most? So if I only had an hour a week, um, it would be the email, hands down. Um, yes. The longer answer is uh, in contact with current customers to see how we can better serve them provided that we, you or we have additional products to offer them. And I think, um, you know, that goes with that concept of when we were driving to farmer's market every Saturday morning in the dark, and we we're passing all these houses and people are waking up and turning their lights on. And we thought, if every one of these houses that we pass would purchase from us, we actually wouldn't have to go all the way into the city to the market to sell. We could just sell the people up and down our road. Um, so it's a similar type of mindset of if they're happy with the vegetables we have, but they're getting meat elsewhere, then let's have that conversation about how can we help provide for them what they need. Um, you know, that's the reason we added pork on. We didn't really want to become pork pig farmers. <laughs> we, we had plenty going on already, um, but there wasn't that particular product of pastured raised organic pork available in our area and people just kept asking and asking and we were to the point of okay we'll give this a try. Um, the third part is where we're spending time now and I think I don't have a grand answer of whether this is what we should be doing but it is in social media um, and we spent a lot of time Facebook and Instagram both on uh, providing better content and sharing more of the farm with the public. Um, 
because we obviously came from that spot where we do the best that we can and the product should speak for itself. And that's really not the whole story anymore these days. Um, the behind the scenes is just as important to people as the food that they're bringing into their kitchen. And so, you know, we have lambing and calving going on right now. And those are things that people aren't going to see at home. So um, yeah. anything that we can do to kind of share those experiences is what we're focusing on more for the rest of the year. Why do you think that behind the scenes material is so important? Well, it's um, people are maybe looking for a little bit of connection, um, whether it's a connection with their farmer or a connection with how their food was raised. Um, you know, that's part of, of supporting a local farm. It's not just the financial part, but it's um, the knowledge and the awareness and being able to sit down at dinner with the family and talk about where the turnips came from and what went into making the bacon and um, how it feels good to put your money where your mouth is and, and support yeah. the type of, you know, production that you're happy with. Yeah, you guys, I want you to really listen to what Ann just said, because I, I say this often that people are not just buying the product itself. They're buying, they're buying the feelings that come with the product too. And uh, you really have to understand what is, what is that life transformation that those people are seeking and what you just described was like, well, what they really want is transparency. What they really want is that peace of mind was they really want to know is, is who made this and who's the farmer and the stories behind the food. And that piece is actually what makes your product valuable. So when you know what those things are and you are intentional about doing that, that's when you're going to create loyal customers. I think that the power of social media, I don't know if you agree with this, this is going off script now, Ian, but like, mm -hmm. I think for me, the power of social media hasn't always been like, oh, this is where I make conversions or this is where I make a ton of sales. It's actually like the prep work before someone decides to become a customer. So it's value is like the storytelling so that they get to know me. So they get to connect with the farmer. They begin to grow and trust me and feel like they can start talking to me. And then when social media has done its job, now they're actually going to go check me out on the website and then maybe buy. And now I have their email address and we can continue to grow. But I just feel like the value of social media is really that those first stages of the journey before a person even begins to buy. And of course they come back once they're a customer and they keep consuming that content and interacting with you. But I, to me as a business owner, it's really valuable on the front end. I don't know if you would, uh, would if that's also been your experience. I do agree with you. I think, um, I mean, it's your opportunity to share what you have on your farm or what your, you know, your goals or your, the values of the farm family in a setting. And that gives the opportunity for someone to decide they want to learn more or, or no, this doesn't align with me and move yeah. on. And, you know, that's just as valuable because we can't be all things to all people. So putting ourselves out there enough to share what our experience or our story or our approach to production lets the customer then decide if they want to be a partner in that journey. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, in theory, they'll go Google you or look up your website address if you've been advertising that. And you mentioned earlier that um, you're really relying on your website to kind of help move people along in the journey. Do you run Ad, like paid ads to get people to that website or are you just ranking high on Google or like uh, how is that how are they actually getting there are they choosing to go look you up because you've been creating connection so we have not done paid ads on Google although we've talked about it um, and we might in the future what about on Facebook do you use um, paid ads on, on specific times of year so okay. we're looking to hire or looking to fill CSA shares or maybe it's turkey season and we try, try to um, sell all our turkeys before Thanksgiving by pre-order because the day after Thanksgiving is a really hard day to sell a turkey <laughs> um, so if there's a special thing that we're trying to promote then we will do some pay ads on Facebook um, and now Instagram, and I'm not certain how how much those pay off. So literally, like we're talking thirty dollars or maybe forty. Yeah. We're not spending tons of money. Um, 
I think on the website, it's a combination of just longevity of mm -hmm. um, keywords and yeah. all the things that play into SEO. Um, and we, we update our blog at least weekly. So a piece of our email does go onto our website. So it's content that is available free if somebody wants to dig down in there and find it. And, you know, we've kind of been back and forth on whether to provide that. <clears throat> we don't necessarily provide our CSA member information free on the website, but there is an additional content piece that we do post every week to try to keep fresh information up there. And I know I attend the Google Analytics small business mm -hmm. development course that my local library offers every year and whatever additional things. So we do spend time and effort at least trying to educate ourselves on what we should be doing. We don't always get everything done, but at, yeah. least, at least it helps us to know where to spend our time. Yeah. And that's okay, right? Like just yeah. do, do what's good enough. It sounds like you're doing well with your business. So, you know, that's yeah. always an indicator like, hey, do I really need to be pushing the crazy advertising if we're, if we're doing okay right now? So, yeah, there's um, always, you know, there's always more to do and there's always things to learn and different parts of our business are always changing. So yeah. I don't ever feel like we can sit back and think, oh, this is great. It just, there's just always more. Um, yeah. It's just how much energy into which thing. Yeah. Right. Right. So, um, uh, tell me a little bit about the genesis of your or the evolution of your website. Cause you did reach out to me a year ago and you're like, Hey, I want you to audit my website. Tell me what I can do differently. What has that whole journey been like for you? Uh, what, what was the reason behind wanting to fix it? And then um, where are you at with it right now? Yeah. <clears throat> so thanks. Yeah. Thanks for your help on that last year. Um, so we knew we needed to do something and it was to the point where we could update a little bit of text here and there, but it was created so many years prior that we didn't have the expertise in, in computer language to know how to update our own site. Um, so at that point, we made the decision to just update the WordPress in order to retain all of the links to other sites and the track back. Mm -hmm. And I'm speaking of things I don't necessarily yeah. know the right language, but um, we, we made that decision. So um, we hired a local firm here who did that work for us. Um, at the same time, we did a rebrand. So a new logo, um, refined our colors that we were using, got some consistency across of our uh, banner and labels and stickers and our print newsletters and our electronic newsletters and try to just uh, clean it up because it, we were way overdue for some freshening. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, took a lot of your advice um, and worked with our, our local team and agreed upon a budget and we put money into paying them to basically overhaul it for us. So it was mm -hmm. update the back end so that it functioned better. Um, got a bunch of new photos. Um, we had a CSA member that that works in branding, and so it was great to work with her. She had tremendous energy and ideas, and um, we felt fortunate. She's a photographer as well, so we got a bunch of great photos out of it. Um, and now we're in a position we were trained on how to update the pages, you know, ourselves and. And we've maintained the relationship there where they're also hosting the site for us. So that whole aspect of being hacked or the site being down, mm -hmm. it's off of our shoulders. The other thing that we like about it is because I guess it's WordPress, um, you don't pay the monthly fee. It, it's our content that lives there. And so that's kind of reassuring that um, if the site were to go down, we'd still our content. So. We, um, on the, the commerce portion of the site, I mentioned we had started with turkeys. Um, we had a Shopify site for about a year and a half. And actually, I really like that open the box works well program. It has a lot of really nice features as far as filling orders, the abandoned shopping cart where it sends an email to a customer to say, you left something in your cart and you didn't check out. Why don't you go ahead and pay for it? And it's amazing how many people will follow that up and, yes, and actually yes. make the purchase. Um, so that, that was nice. Um, we paid a lot in fees because, uh, 
the, the way we had originally set it up with Shopify. Um, so it was good to walk away from some of that financial commitment there. Um, if I was starting from scratch, I would probably go back to Shopify for just a traditional store online and it had enough capacity that it could handle being your website portion, you know, as well, the educational part of the site. Mm -hmm. um, so this year we just wanted to refresh and so I reached out to you to, to give us some feedback on some things that we had missed. Um, as well as, you know, there were four to five of us working on different portions of our site and sometimes things by committee kind of end up being things by committee. And so I wanted to make sure that we kind of hit everything that we needed to and that our site is mm -hmm. a good user experience because it basically yes. comes down to customer experience on whether they're going to come back or not. Right. And that's the value of of making sure your website is is clear, right? Like there needs to be it needs to be easy for a person to understand when they get there. What are my options? How can I start doing business with you? What are you selling? Yes. <laughs> uh, and how do I get how do I get there? Uh, and so it, yeah, it's just yeah. so it's so much better now. And I just again encourage people to go check that out. Now, one special feature of your website I wanted to talk about a little bit about here was this video yeah. that you had made. Um, it's called why join the organic customizable csa farm share and it's on one of your sliding banner images you guys you just got to go watch that video in fact i will put the link to the video in the show notes it's a youtube video because it's it's so well produced it's short and it just inspires you and it makes you want to join your csa and so i just feel like it's a great template if somebody's looking for how to build one of these kind of videos, go there and just kind of pay attention to what do they do first? And then they have a section where they have somebody talking and then they say this, like, it's, it's really well done. How did that come to be? Well, we knew that we wanted to increase videos. That was one of our goals last year for 2021. Um, both small little videos on social media, as well as we wanted to do two to three to four larger videos. And, um, we had started with an idea of just introducing the farm, but we quickly realized, you know, CSA shares were what we were selling during this past winter. So that's what the focus needed to be. Um, we we're fortunate that um, a, two different people that have joined our, our team had experience uh, and prior had worked in video production. So um, they didn't know a whole lot about farming, but knew about the production portion. And we kind of hit the notes of the things that we wanted to say. So we didn't necessarily write out a script, but we did have talking points that we knew we wanted covered in the video. Um, because we did have a winter CSA, we did have access to customers every week. Um, so we kind of identified a short list of people that we liked that seemed to like us, reached out, all of them 100% said sure would be happy to and we were just lucky really that's the, the short answer is we were lucky um, they said great things they uh, and we were able to put it all together in a way that hopefully someone that doesn't know anything about the farm could get that experience and get some of their questions answered and so coming from the perspective of a CSA member or shareholder is what we were aiming for yeah, you guys, seriously, like even if you're thinking about doing a video and you're just not sure how to put it together, I think that your video is a great template that you could you could send your videographer there and say, I want it to be like this. <laughs> and somebody can see uh, that person would be able to see the structure of, of how to put it together. And then you they would just insert. It's it's fantastic. It was one of my favorite parts. And I think you should yeah. highlight it more on your website. So it's really, okay. really good. Thank you. Um, or put it in other places too, like post it on your social or uh, yeah, find other ways to talk about it. So one of the last questions I want to ask you before we wrap up is what have been, what have been some of the struggles that you've had with marketing in the past? Um, or maybe even some that you're continuing to have. This is maybe more selfish of me because I'm trying to sure. understand my farmers better. I think one of the struggles is because we are diversified and do so many different products, it's hard to talk about them all without sounding like 
you do all of that? How do you do all of that? Or someone might not be interested in any of our meats because they're vegetarian and it's just the CSA vegetables that is of interest to them. So trying to balance the messaging um, just in general. And it's, we go back and forth and try different things, but overall that's been a little, um, a little bit of a challenge. You know, if we were just doing blueberries and beef, it would be a lot easier to know what we needed to talk about all the time. Hmm. Um, another challenge has been staying fresh and relevant in the local food scene. And, you know, there's a benefit to being around for so long and the longevity, but at the same time, there's always the bright, shiny new thing over here that people like to maybe, maybe I should go try that, or maybe I should go try that, this. And, you know, our, our way has been just to be consistent and offer quality and try to keep people happy. And we have several, several, several members that come back. So they may try a farm that's cheaper or closer or that's their neighbor's nephew or whatever the reason is. Um, so it's just uh, maintaining the messaging of all farms are good and you're supporting local, which is great. And here's why we want you to be here, but we don't want to talk negatively about anything else in agriculture because there's so few of us all together. We're all in this together. We want to stay positive on that note. So messaging is, has been a little bit of a challenge there. Is it competitive? Do you feel competitive with some of so, the farms around you? Or is that um, like, it's a double-edged sword for us here. Like I'm always trying to say there's, they're yeah. my friends, but yeah. at the same time, I'm like, is there enough to go around? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's enough eaters to go around. Is there enough people that are interested in a local organic CSA where they travel to the farm? You know, that is a much smaller subset mm -hmm. of people. And so, you know, adding home delivery or adding customization. Um, when we started CSA, we truly thought that we needed to be organic in order to ask someone to prepay for something, that there needed to be an additional value of what they were getting that they couldn't just get at the farmer's market. Um, but, you know, most of the CSA farms in our area are not. Um, it's, it actually was even promoted for as a while for a great opportunity for new farmers which you and I know is not, um, you right. actually need to have some experience before you, you commit <laughs> to a CSA program. And so mm -hmm. it's kind of leveled out in our area. There's, uh, there's a healthy saturation of CSA farms. Yes. Um, but at the same time, it does educate more of the public about what a CSA is. And so mm -hmm. it, the tide is lifting slightly on the number of people that might be interested. I remember in the auto, that was one of the things I told you was um, you could you could add some additional like social proof things to your site, like letting people know we've been around since, you know, X, Y, Z. We have a CSA that serves 800 people, like little stats like that mm -hmm. can help a consumer who's shopping around, like feel more confident about choosing you mm -hmm. over the competition because they're like, oh, well, they have more experience or they serve more people or here's a testimonial I'm reading how they love it. Right. So um, that's probably a, a way that you can combat that as well. I wanted to talk to you about your, this is, I promise the final question. Okay. I, I'm going off my notes here. Um, this has been a great interview. So this is fascinating. Um, so Spruce Eats mm -hmm. and Cooks Illustrated awarded you with some special certification isn't the right word, but uh, a noteworthy prize. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that and um, how that happened and what you're doing with that information? Sure. So Cook's Illustrated was, well, actually both of them were related to the organic turkeys. Um, Cook's Illustrated uh, purchased heritage breed turkeys from around the country, mail order, and did their cooking in the kitchen and their they're um, testing and then produce the results. And we learned about it like everyone else in the world when the magazine slash website came out. Um, we were the only organic turkey at, to be recommended. And so it was a wonderful, wonderful um, 
situation to be in. Complete surprise um, because they had just ordered turkeys as if it were a homeowner ordering turkeys for a big event. So we didn't even know it was happening. Um, mm. And then Spruce also included us um, as one of the places to secure a locally, ra well, not locally, a farm raised organic heritage turkey um, because we were shipping. And so I think it was lucky, but at the same time, we're one of the few farms that are, that are doing it. And so that positioned us to be available on, you know, when you punch into Google, we're one of the ones that mm. come up. So you think that that's how you were discovered by both of them? They were, they had a topic they're looking to find, where can I get this so I can do a test and, yes. and you showed up. I nice. we think so. Yeah. So. And so that speaks to your, again, your website is, has so many backlinks. It's, it's easy to, you know, the SEO is incredible. <laughs> um, and I'm sure that helped you. So hopefully. Yeah. So. And so are you, are you, do you still talk, when, when was that award from Cooks Illustrated, for instance, and are you still talking about that when you try to sell your products? Mm -hmm. So the Spruce was actually last year. Um, and then Cooks was, I think it's been about four years. Um, possibly they have an update in the works. Um, we have our suspicion, but we're not for sure. <laughs> Mm -hmm. There was some ordering that went on this past Thanksgiving. <laughs> um, and we do try to talk about it. And, um, you know, one of the questions that we try to ask, and we don't always do a great job of that, but it is asking, how did you hear about us? How did you find out about us? Because that tells us where to put our efforts and where to put our energy or our dollars on um, getting the word out and in marketing. Um, and a lot of people did mention the um, Cooks Illustrated. So we, we hope that there's an update and um, we continue to, there's that fine line between not being boastful, but it being celebrating, you know, your successes when they come along. Yeah. Well, I didn't actually check when I audited, but that product item description, you should have that. Do you have that little award listed? with it you should yeah and you we should and if you, if you can figure if you can figure out how to put a little like ribbon image on that product yeah. like that would cause someone's eye to be like what did they win with this product so just an idea i don't know if that's yeah. possible with no, your that's store. a great idea great idea thank yeah you. this has been a wonderful interview thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom where can people learn more about your farm if they want to uh check out check out what you do um, Corinna, our website is elmwoodstockfarm.com. Uh, we also are on Instagram and Facebook, uh, starting a small little YouTube channel there as well. And we really appreciate the opportunity. It's been a lot of fun talking to you. I've learned so much from you listening to your podcast. So it's been an honor for me to be here as well. And mm. thank you so, so much. Such a good interview, right? So many value bombs that Ann drops in that episode. I hope you got a lot out of that. That was seriously one of the best interviews that I've done for this podcast. And I'm sure I'm going to be referencing back to it in years to come. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit the subscribe button. And if you have an idea for, so for someone to come onto the podcast that I should interview, or if you have a topic that you want me to talk about, please send me an email at mydigitalfarmers at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. Well, that's all I got today. You guys, if you want the show notes, head to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash 109. And you guys have yourself a great week. I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.